Boker Tov, Shalom Lekulchem. Good morning. Welcome, uh, everybody. Thank you for joining, I guess, one of the opening sessions of uh, Cyber Week. Um, we're very happy to be partnering with our colleagues uh, at Cyber Week and Tel Aviv University. Uh, I'll say just a brief word or two about the Israel Tech Policy Institute because we're really officially, in many ways, uh, launching or relaunching this week. And then we'll jump in to the real meat of what we are looking to talk about today, the GDPR. Uh, the Israel Tech Policy Institute is a new institute, a tech policy think tank uh, in Israel. Um, it's an affiliate a division of the Future of Privacy Forum. My name is Jules Polonetsky. I'm the CEO of the Future of Privacy Forum. Uh, and together with my colleague Omer Tanay, law professor from Israel and, uh, uh, and uh, vice president of the IAPP, one of the leading privacy organizations, uh, we thought that it was an incredible opportunity uh, to bring together both Europe, Israel, uh, the US, um, many of the leading academics, leading companies, uh, leading civil society. We don't make any progress on data protection and privacy uh, if we don't engage uh, all of those elements and then of course government so that we can actually figure out a reasonable path forward. Uh, we all know of Israel as startup nation. Um, our argument is that Israel also is a place that should be and can be startup policy nation. Uh, for many years, many of the companies that we sometimes talk to in Israel say, well, I'm coming up with the new business model. My general counsel in New York is dealing with compliance and my chief marketing officer is dealing with these things. But today, if data is core to what we're doing, if data is the product, whether it's AI or mobility, we need to be sophisticated, not solely because of compliance issues, making sure we're dealing with GDPR, making sure we're dealing with the Israel privacy and security laws, but we need to be sophisticated about the rules around data and trust if innovation is gonna succeed. And so this is our hope and our goal and our mission. But of course, making sure we comply with GDPR is probably the way to start before we think of the broad global trust issues. So without too much further delay, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, to you the moderator of this panel and uh, my co-chair at the uh, Israel Tech Policy Institute, Omer Tanay. One quick thought, and then I hand you to Omer. Uh, we're very delighted that we have just uh, published um, the Cambridge Handbook of Consumer Privacy, Cambridge University, not Cambridge Analytica. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I was telling someone about the book, uh, Cambridge, they said, oh, Cambridge Analytica. I'm like, a thousand years of scholarship, and the first thing you think of now is Cambridge Analytica. Okay, um, but this book has 30 different views on privacy, from data brokers, to European regulators, to privacy advocates, to academics, all under one umbrella, which is very exciting. Uh, it's a, a reference book. Um, it's selling on Amazon for more than $100, so I don't wanna sell it to you. I wanna give it to you, so if you are ready to consent freely and willingly uh, to providing your email address to the young man who's scanning, we will choose and uh, give out uh, one uh, today and one at the end of the day uh, as well. Uh, of course, you can then revoke your consent and we'll respect your right to be deleted and, we'll, uh, <laughs> you, and you can keep the book uh, and uh, we'll be kosher with all the regulators around the world. Omer. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Jules, it, uh, I think the price it's selling for Amazon is $140, so you can go uh, turn around and sell it maybe for 80 bucks on eBay, uh, uh, and it would make the visit here worthwhile. Um, I wanted to just put another plug in uh, for my, um, uh, uh, for the, the institution I work for, which is the IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Uh, the IAPP is a professional community. It's a professional association for people who work uh, uh, in privacy. It's international, like the I suggest. So we have members all over the world. Uh, we currently have more than 42,000 members, and the membership has grown immensely, as you can imagine, over the past few years with the really importance and um, uh, acceptance of this issue as like a major central issue for companies and for the government also. Um, 
What we offer is training and certifications. We have a few certifications for privacy professionals, the CIPP, the CIPM, and the CIPT. Uh, we also have publications and research and um, uh, big events. Uh, uh, and uh, I invite you to visit the website and to check it out because there is really an immense amount of resources uh, that are available for people who work in privacy. Uh, we started up mostly uh, uh, as compliance and legal. Uh, that's where kind of privacy came from about a decade ago. But now uh, lawyers are actually a minority in our midst. And most of the members are IT people and just corporate uh, management. Uh, so with that, I want to get to our topic, the GDPR. Uh, uh, and the GDPR is more than a buzzword, it's, uh, uh, it's an important law, and I think the first thing to know about GDPR, if I teach it like uh, a law school course, which I used to do, is that it's a regulation as opposed to the directive which was in place before it. So there was a data protection directive in Europe uh, from 1995. Directives don't have direct effect, so they need to be implemented into member state legislation. Uh, the technical term is transposed by adopting legislation. Uh, the regulation, on the other hand, is European level law that does have direct effect. So technically, it doesn't have to be transposed in order to have effect in all of the European member states. We still see adopting legislation because you need the whole administrative law cover for, you know, setting up data protection authorities, for example, that have the powers to do what uh, DPAs are uh, required to do under the GDPR. But on the whole, GDPR has direct effect, so it will harmonize European law to a greater, a greater extent than the 95 directive did. Um, one of the uh, new, or maybe even the most important new aspect of the regulation is the sanctions provision. Uh, uh, it's an open secret that the directive has been in place for, um, you know, more than 20 years, but that there was very little enforcement on the ground. Uh, with GDPR, that might conceivably change, at least the European data protection authorities will have the power and really strong powers to enforce. Everybody heard about the 4% of global annual turnover as a potential fine, which is, of course, uh, uh, you know, gigantic for some of the big multinational companies or 20 million euros, whatever is higher. So very robust uh, sanctions. It also introduces a few new rights, although for the most part, it's based on the same principles as the Data Protection Directive, uh, but it has a couple of uh, novel uh, uh, ideas, some new rights, the right to be forgotten, which is really a continuation of a right to uh, data deletion erasure that existed before, and the right of data portability, which is uh, uh, a new concept in uh, this space. It introduces a breach notification uh, um, uh, framework uh, requirement, which is something that was actually uh, uh, imported from the US, where it exists in, uh, I think, 48 states now. Um, and what we're going to start with is the very vast um, uh, uh, territorial reach. Because, you know, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it probably. I imagine that most of you are not uh, scholars and researchers in European law. And uh, w the interest in this is obviously not just for academic sort of uh, purposes. What's the law in Europe now? It actually applies to uh, a great part of the industry worldwide. So with that, I'll introduce our... Uh, uh, presenters for this first uh, uh, session, uh, Gabriela Zanfir Fortuna is a policy fellow, a Council. policy council at the Future of Privacy Forum. Uh, she's based in the U.S. now, but she is uh, a European uh, originally and actually worked for the European Data Protection Supervisor. 
uh, for a few years, so she has uh, the regulatory experience uh, uh, as well. Gabe Maldoff is um, an associate at Bird and Bird in London, and before that he worked with us at the IPP, and he is Canadian, but now living in, uh, uh, in Europe, well, in Europe, in London, which, which is still Europe for, for about a year. Um, so, oh, you have the helm, guys. And do we have the clicker? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Omar, for the introduction and for the overview of the GDPR. Uh, I'll see how I can make this. Yeah, hold on. There. And it's this one. Yeah. Okay. So, if I. No. Uh, I'll go. Okay, let's do it this way. Okay, thank you. Um, so Omar already talked a bit about uh, the territorial reach of the GDPR, the extraterritorial reach of the GDPR. Uh, we are going to talk about that in detail. Uh, well, actually, before starting, uh, we want to let you know that we will be taking questions uh, during our presentation. Uh, we also have, at the very end, if there will be time, a specific um, section for question and answers. But if you think that you want to clarify something immediately, just raise your hand uh, and we'll be happy to, to take the question. Um, so just like with every other regulation, uh, there are three factors that need to meet for the GDPR to be applicable to a certain situation. Uh, the material part of it, the personal scope of it, and the territorial scope of it. All three must come together. So, um, the material scope of it as, uh, answers the question, to what does it apply? It applies to processing of personal data, and we'll see that uh, in detail, what that, what that, uh, that means. Uh, then the personal scope is to whom does it apply? Does it only apply to European citizens? The personal data of whom, right? And to what kind of companies does it apply? To what kind, does it apply to public institutions as well? We'll see. And then also the territorial scope of it. So where does it apply? Uh, does it only apply in the European Union or does it also apply to organizations outside of the European Union? Does it only apply to personal data of persons in the European Union or also of persons outside of the European Union? These are complex questions and we need all three of these um, areas to meet in order for the GDPR to be applicable. And this is what we are going to do uh, now in the first session of the day. We're trying to bring a bit of clarity uh, for that. Um, so, we'll start with the to what does it apply. We'll start with some of the general um, points. Uh, as, uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, it applies to all processing of personal data. And that happens irrespective of the field of activity or industry. And irrespective of whether we are talking a private sector or a public sector organization uh, in the EU public sector. Um, however, it does not apply to law enforcement authorities. Uh, there is a specific directive uh, that entered into force also um, in May 2018 that applies to law enforcement. So we are outside of that area. Um, it doesn't apply to the national security area. So we are outside of that area. And also, and this is quite important, it doesn't apply to activities that are pu purely personal or household activities. So, I mean, this is logical, let's say. If you have uh, your uh, contact list for your uh, phone, right, you will not be a controller uh, for uh, GDPR purposes, uh, uh, you know, when you are handling your uh, contact list there. Um, there was a very interesting case at the Court of Justice. Uh, what about a CCTV camera that someone places uh, outside their own home, looking towards the outside, looking towards the street? Is that purely personal or not? That's the Rinesh case. And actually the Court of Justice said that, well, it's not really personal or only purely household because it looks towards the outside, it looks on the public road. However, there are uh, certain exceptions that apply to that situation. 
Um, and finally, the GDPR does not apply when the processing is done by an EU institution or body, uh, like the European Commission, for example, because there's a special regulation that deals with that. Uh, so other than these exceptions, uh, then it applies to all sorts of organizations, uh, like uh, hospitals that process patient and staff data, uh, student data processed by university, um, processing of tax data but by national tax authorities in the EU. These are just some examples. Um, Can I pop a question here? Uh, and just to reiterate what Gabriela said, uh, feel free to raise your hand and at any time to ask a question. So um, you, you talked about law enforcement authorities and national security, and especially for the crowd here dealing with uh, cyber issues. Uh, Liana, this doesn't work. Um, I was wondering, there's a whole ecosystem around law enforcement and national security authorities. So it's not just the, you know, the police or the uh, security service, it's also companies that are in this space and, uh, for example, working as service providers or data processors, we'll get to that term, for the police or for a national security service. Are those covered or is their activity covered? or is So is it a, a substantive ex exemption or is it an institutional exemption? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I would say it is mainly an institutional exemption because, for instance, under the Law Enforcement Directive, uh, we have um, the competent authorities defined as controllers, uh, as far as I know. Um, however, I do believe that if the processing is done for purposes uh, on behalf of a law enforcement controller, like competent authorities, uh, the applicable regime would be the one of the law enforcement directive mm -hmm. or the national security for those purposes. Um, I, here, I would just like to mention that the law enforcement directive has very similar rules to uh, the GDPR, um, including rules about data protection officers and um, data breach notifications, uh, processors, and so on. Um, the national security area is another debate. That's uh, something else. Uh, but I would say that um, this is, yeah, this is a very complex issue. Um, and I'll stick to, to my interpretation that if it's done for the purposes of a controller that falls under the law enforcement directive, it should comply with that directive. Right, so uh, I think it's I, important. I mean, uh, important. I, I'm curious what Gabe thinks. Yeah, so we'll hear you, Gabe, but you have, like, it's not the regulator, but she's a former regulator, so for those of you in this space, you can take a note of that, Gabe. Yeah, so we'll get into this in more detail in a bit later, what the differences between controllers and processors. Um, but, and so this will become clear in a moment, but um, very clearly where you're a processor and you're supplying services to the government and it's acting under its capacity, um, under a law enforcement or national security capacity, then that will be the regime that applies. Um, in the space where you're a controller and you're offering services to the government, um, I don't have the yeah. answer. I, I, I would think Omer mentioned at the beginning that the GDPR broadly harmonizes laws across the EU, but the law enforcement stuff is still very much national. Um, and so I wouldn't feel comfortable answering that without looking at national law. Yep. Okay. Um, what is personal data? So the, the GDPR is a data protection regulation. Um, so therefore, right at, at its root, you have to understand what is personal data. Um, and unfortunately, um, this is one of the more nebulous concepts in, in the regulation. Um, and um, it's actually, I like the example that Gabriella gave of the CCTV case, which seemed to take a really broad view of what's considered one's domestic use. Um, just as kind of a disclaimer right at the top, um, the GDPR is, um, is a regulation, but it's also effectuating um, a, a charter value. Um, so it's effectuating the right to privacy and the right to data protection. And so there is a tendency in the EU by courts and regulators to interpret a lot of these provisions um, quite broadly. 
Um, You've and become European. <laughs> You're speaking like one of them. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> while, while the UK is Brexiting, I'm somehow entering. Um, anyway, uh, the point though is that um, if some of you are lawyers, we have a tendency to look at definitions and words and try to find um, the exceptions and the narrowing interpretation. Uh, but courts in the EU really don't seem to do that in data protection, and nor do regulators. And so um, you, you'll notice a theme of quite broad interpretations, and personal data is no exception. So um, at root, the definition contains three elements. It's any information. So uh, information, not documents, um, not text. It can include photos, opinions, um, but also, you know, it, Personal data is contained within documents. It's not documents itself. Um, it has to relate to um, an identified or identifiable natural person. And it's that last piece that's the hardest one. At what point is someone identifiable? And the regulation is really helpful. It says someone is identifiable if you can identify them by reasonable means. Um, so I think this picture gives a good example of that. Imagine uh, one of your grandparents was in this photo. Um, and you were trying to single them out. Um, you could probably find them if they were in the first row, but at some point you wouldn't be able to identify them. And, and that's really how this concept of personal data works. It's where the borders are is not always um, crystal clear. Can I maybe just interject? And I, I just want to maybe set this up and say that uh, strikingly, for a framework, a legal framework that's been in place more than 20 years and actually more than 30 years for the fair information uh, principles. It goes back to the OECD in 1980 uh, and the uh, European Convention 108 in uh, 1981. Uh, the most fundamental building block of this entire framework, the definition of personal data, still is the most hotly debated issue about this uh, regulation. So, um, the, the, you know, we kind of speak about this and we'll pass on to the next subject, but we haven't really passed on in privacy the, the trying to decide what is or what is in personal data, what is identified or identifiable, is a hugely important issue. Uh, just to put it in perspective, sorry. Yeah, and obviously dependent on context and um, technology. There's a question over there. Yeah, thanks. So about personal information, who is the judge of that? Like, who is the person that decides that something is actually, someone is identifiable? Are you using state-of-the-art technology to, to understand that? I mean, there's different mathematical ways of determining if someone is reasonably identifiable. What's the standard? I understand there's no set standard. A, a difficult question. Um, it's hard to put precise contours around that, but I think one point that you've highlighted is that um, it is somewhat context dependent. So um, information in the hands of one person may, not may be personal data for them, but may not be personal data in the hands of someone else, because you need to look at what information would be reasonably available to that um, organization in order to, to identify um, and single out the individual. I don't know if Gabrielle, you just, uh, have some I just thoughts. wanted to add that in terms of who is the judge of that, the first one that is called to be the judge is actually the organization that controls the data. It's the controller. That's the first one. Uh, so if you are working with sets of data, uh, it's part of the accountability of the organization, and we'll talk about the principle of accountability and how important it became under the GDPR to decide if you are working with personal data or not. So the organization is the first one that has to look at it and reason around it, and perhaps the organization comes to the conclusion that, you know, uh, if uh, th there are no reasonable means for anyone to re-identify or to identify this data, or there are reasonable means, uh, and depending on that, you put in place safeguards and you, know, you, you follow with a, a, com a compliance program, uh, but the, the organization is the, main, the first one. And then, of course, if someone has a problem um, with that, you know, they can go and complain to an, an authority, and then the authority will, will have a look at it and say, uh, well, it is or it is not personal data, 
And then whatever the authority says can be challenged in court, either by the organization or by the individual. And then ultimately, the courts will uh, have the last word. Okay, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I think we, we get the question, it's a big issue. We'll talk about device identifiers and also some of the pseudonymous identifiers in a minute, but yeah. let's maybe get through the definition and I'll hit pause on the answer to that, okay? And actually, um, we're, we're right there. Um, so there's guidance from the Information Commissioner in the UK, um, which addresses this point. And um, what they said was that um, it's not about um, the, the nature of the information itself, but rather um, like what actions you can take with respect to an individual from that information. So if, you're, if you can single someone out, if you can use that information to distinguish one individual from another and take um, discrete action with respect to that individual, um, then it will be personal data. So what does that mean in practice? Um, a few kind of concrete guideposts. If the data is obviously about someone, so it's their name, it's uh, a social security number, a government identification number, um, then very clearly it's personal data. Um, and then relatedly, if it's linked to that information, then it also will be personal data. So uh, the statement, um, Tel Aviv is beautiful, um, not personal data. But suddenly, if you see that um, in the context of a tweet I've, I've made, then um, that is my personal data. It reveals things about um, my opinions and where I was. Um, so anything linked to, um, to obviously identifiable information is also personal data. Um, and then this final piece goes uh, to the heart of your question, which is whether it's designed to have a particular or personalized impact for an individual. So if you, if you think about behavioral advertising as one example of that, uh, the advertiser may have no idea who it's sending the ad to in, in the real world. It, it may not know um, their name. Um, it, it may not be able to pick them out from a lineup of people. But it, the advertiser does know that it wants to send a message to that device ID because it will have an impact on the person who's associated with that device ID. And because of that, it's necessarily personal data. Gabe, can I, can I ask you, um, so setting aside the direct identifiers, which uh, the question raised, uh, some of them are more sort of directly identifiable, like a social security number, ID number in Israel, uh, some less, like maybe an IP address or a cookie. Um, I want to ask you about the indirect identifying information. When does it cross the threshold of becoming identified or identifiable? So the example is um, a Canadian uh, person at Tel Aviv University. I'm sure you know the, um, there are several, uh, uh, right? It's, it's a big place here. But once you narrow it in, so in Tel Aviv University and the Naftali building in this room, you know, maybe the, is there another Canadian person here? 
No. So see, so, <laughs> so, so, so we just narrowed it down to a group of one. When does, so a Canadian person in Tel Aviv University, maybe not, but in this room, yes, that's you. Oh. Well, I think um, I'll actually defer to you on that one because I think you're the expert on, on where um, That's not where fair. you draw that line. Um, I can say that regulators in the EU take a very broad view of this. Um, and so they say if it's possible to single someone out from the information, then it would be personal. Uh, but where exactly that line will be drawn in due course, I don't think, um, Gabriella, do we have no. any clear cases on this? There, we don't have any clear cases, and this is also because there will always be a case-by-case -case assessment. So this is the case uh, a lot in EU data protection law with a lot of the questions, because that's, that's the truth. I mean, it, it's exactly how you pointed it out. If we add uh, the room factor in your example, then it's clear that we're talking about Gabe. Um, so that's why any detail of the, of, of the question is important. Unfortunately, yeah, it's, it's really contextual. And um, this is a good segue for uh, the, the following slides because we have some examples here about information that has been uh, declared by the Court of Justice of the European Union, so the court that has the ultimate, is the ultimate judge, as, uh, as uh, we talked about earlier. Um, so we have um, a, a quite a big body of case law, uh, could be bigger, I'm sure it will uh, be bigger, but uh, we do have some case law. And for instance, um, we have a lot of information that has been uh, found to be personal data by the court, such as um, uh, your salaries or information related to income, of course, uh, then uh, any sorts of subsidies someone receives, that's also a personal inf information, biometric information, so your fingerprints, um, iris scans, that's personal data. And then to go to the question earlier, the court actually found that IP addresses are personal data. And once the Court of Justice of the European Union decides on something like that, uh, this will be the case. Um, we will not be able to uh, counter argue it. Uh, then we have traffic and location data uh, that have been found to be personal data. Um, yes, we have a question. Well, Gabriela, would you agree or disagree the case, the prior decision that you were referring to? It's, it's an, oh. The prior decision is on, on the yeah. next slide. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whether the question is fully concluded, yeah. uh, would you agree that the cases that we have were cases where the court believed that even if that company wasn't going to be able to do it, it was reasonable that other parties could do it, and prior yeah. specifically government-owned websites, do we still have some possibility that uh, a company might be using IP address, but take steps where it's closer to certain, guaranteed, that nobody reasonably will be able to make the link up, even government or at least uh, the others. With dynamic IP addresses. There is, because the court left a bit of room there, and uh, exactly in one moment we'll talk about that. This this other case, the Scarlet Extended case, that's that was about you know the fixed IP addresses. There was no um, um, variable in, in, in variable number in those IP addresses in this particular case. So the fixed IP address, as such, without any other conditions, was found to be personal data by the court. Thank you. 
uh, the, the logistical note, uh, I see people standing in the back. There are a lot of uh, free seats here, first couple of rows, business class seats, and they're free. Um, and also, I see people taking photos of the screen, so you're free to do it. You're welcome, but we will make the whole deck available uh, for download, so rest assured. Yes. Um... And talking about the dynamic IP addresses, so he, here we have another list of uh, personal data, and you'll see here, um, I think, yeah, I just, so uh, the dynamic IP address was also found to be personal data, but exactly how Jules pointed, it, pointed out, there was a condition attached to it, and the court said that it is, a, it is personal data as long as there is a lawful way for an entity, which does not necessarily have to be the controller, to uh, combine, to put together the information to identify the person. So if there is a lawful way to access um, the missing part of the information uh, to make the IP address um, you know, more targeted, then that uh, dynamic IP address is personal data. And in the case at hand, oh, one second, in the case at hand in Briar, that was the case. We have a question. That is correct, exactly, that is, the, that is correct. So you don't have to know the first name, the last name of a person. It's, it, it will only matter that you are interested in this person because this person is female, is um, in her 30s, and likes something. So that, that would be enough. We have another question there. Uh, the first question, yes, they're, they're, they are personal uh, data, so MAC addresses, uh, IMI addresses, uh, you know, because they pinpoint to one device. Uh, so uh, as we mentioned, it's not going to matter if we don't know who is the owner of the device. Um, as for the second question, we'll get to that in just three minutes when we talk about the territorial scope and we can address that uh, at that point. Just to give you so, some highlights, the court found that handwriting itself is personal data, that comments made by reviewers on an exam sheet is personal data of both the examiner and the examinee, uh, and also, um, yeah, no, so, um, yeah, those, those would be the most uh, interesting, let's say. Uh, Neil. It's, the, the court just mentioned, you know, legal ways. If there, if there is, if there are legal ways, but um, they did not go beyond this wording to explain what they mean by legal ways. Yeah. Uh, so, so in that case, this is the dynamic IP address. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? So, um, in that case, uh, the company had the dynamic IP address. It said, "Well, we don't have any other information that would allow us to identify this person." Um, and, the, and they argued furthermore that uh, German law prohibited them from asking the ISP, the internet service provider, to give them that information. And the court said, um, well, there are certain exceptions to that law. Um, so in um, a national security event, you would be allowed to go to the ISP and ask for that identifying information. If they were circulating child pornography, you could ask for that information and find that person. And because those legal channels existed, even though no one had ever taken that, even though it wasn't the context, the court said that could be personal data. But the distinction you make is a good because if there was a law that said you may not get that information, you could rely yeah. on the argument that 
I don't have to worry that a hacker can do it. I legally cannot do so, so it is certain that the person won't be identified. And, and maybe exactly. we rely on that. Yeah. And then you see some countries now passing laws that put bans on re-identification, yeah. and that could be helpful to supporting maybe legal or other measures because of the, the fact of the law backing up. So it can be very helpful. Yeah, I think Australia uh, has a provision like that. What, a question? Uh, if, if there are comments made on the margins of the uh, answers uh, in the exam sheet, even if they are typed, uh, the comments, the typed comments are personal data. The handwriting, uh, the court went into looking into the handwriting because, you know, some exams may be written by hand. And even if you don't have an identifier um, on the exam sheet, but it's just written by hand, it, will, it is reasonable to think that you can identify that um, sheet of paper. So this is actually a recent case. This is from 2017. Okay, we have... Has, but you could still argue that, that nobody would bother. Uh, it's technically possible, but it's not reasonably likely that somebody is going to bother, in this particular that somebody is going to bother to do any, to, to identify, to identify using that information. It's not very Let's see how, I mean, the, this case was judged uh, under Directive 95 per 46, not under the GDPR. The GDPR specifically talks about reason, reasonably likely uh, to re-identify or to identify in this case. So let's see how the case law goes. But as it is right now, th that's the case law. The handwriting itself is considered to be personal data, at least in the context of an exam. So, because this is what the case was about, an exam paper. Uh, the, the reasonably likely and sort of, uh, uh, I'm trying to gauge where the state of the art is, is, is obviously a big issue because it's also a moving target and we know that the re-identification attacks, if you will, uh, have become a lot more sophisticated, so much so that some scientists would claim that None of the traditional de-identification you know, uh, techniques like anonymity and the likes are valid. And you know, what, the, um, what reasonable is differs. I mean, I, I see people from the Israeli military here and what you know, military analysts might be able to do and crack through is much more than what you know, behavioral targeting uh, uh, ad tech companies might sort of conceive. But the so, standard is still there. But, but it's reasonably likely to be used. So the, there is a reasonableness you know, uh, uh, term baked into the standard. And yeah. I, I think we should move we'll, on. We'll move on because we, we have, have, we have a lot of material. This issue like uh, you suggested. Sorry? Thank you. 
it's, that's a really good question. We're going to get to the distinction between controllers and processors, which is really important for determining lawfulness, and, and we'll get to that in a minute. It exactly, to, it, it will answer your question, and that's why we'll, we have to run a bit through the last part of the presentation. Yeah. It's just we have 10 minutes uh, max. So, so uh, but just we're going to extend because we started late, just okay. so you know, we'll okay. extend so, about 10 minutes because okay. there is a lot of very important sort of basic definitions to uh, still cover. Uh, very quickly on pseudonymous data. Pseudo um, well, the, the, uh, lawful, the legal term would be data that has undergone a pseudonymization process, not pseudonymous data. And that's important because da personal data that has undergone pseudonymization is still personal data. So um, as long as there is a key that can um, re-identify your pseudonymized data set, that pseudonymized data set is still personal data. And this is very important uh, because uh, I, I saw this expression somewhere, we, we cannot have Schrodinger's data. So um, pseudonymous data, it, it's not anonymous. It's still personal data and uh, the entire GDPR regime will apply to it. Um, so I, I want to uh, ask you about this, Gabriela. Um, uh, uh, Encrypted data. So okay. encrypted data technically is pseudonymized because someone has the key, hopefully, uh, to reopen it. A lot of data processors uh, at least try to only uh, store or handle encrypted data so the client, the customer, the controller can access the data but not the processor. So you're still han handling pseudonymous data by definition. Does the whole thing still apply to you? Uh, I would say yes, even if it's um, encrypted. Uh, the court said uh, in a couple of cases that um, actually it is not important that the key and the key coded data are in the hands of the same person. Mm -hmm. So um, there were uh, two cases uh, that found that um, you, you may, the key may be in, another, in the hands of another person, might be a processor, might be another controller, uh, but that would still make, I mean, if the key exists, even if it's not uh, in your possession, then that would still be uh, personal data. The Anyone first... wants to push back against that? I see some cloud uh, providers in the audience. Uh, uh, so if you handle encrypted data, you're still handling personal data, even if you don't have the key. No pushback, okay. I think we have one pushback. <laughs> oh. yeah. uh? Uh, fair question. That sounds like, uh, uh, let's say, that, like one of the Agatha uh, questions. Well, it, it would be great to know what kind of data you handle. Uh, so, I, I, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, um, I, I would uh, presume the worst case scenario in that case, <laughs> uh, in the sense that it, it does comprise personal data. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to tell you uh, exactly. It's I just... I would tell you that obviously you can't, even if you knew it was personal data, you aren't possibly the player who will be cooperating with every one of the GDPR requirements. But to the extent that the controller is obligated to treat personal data, and you are the processor of that, then your obligations process. are to support the controller. Uh, and you can't say, well, I don't know what's in there. No. Thank so you, this Jules. Is, yes. It's a good segue, I think, to the controller processor question, which is very central. And I think yeah. you should keep in mind that processors are not subject to the whole uh, uh, sort of menu of data uh, and data protection obligations, but only a small subset. Okay. So um, we've just skipped over two sections that I was hoping would give a little more certainty. Um, there were the two points where there's actually a bit of legal clarity, and now we're back into another gray area. Um, so I apologize for that. I guess we're, we're sticking to the ambiguity here. Um, but um, 
these are really important definitions. Bear with the sort of robotic terminology because it's really important to understanding how the GDPR applies. Um, under the GDPR, there are essentially two different types of organizations. There are data controllers and data processors. Data controllers are organizations that decide how and why data will be processed. So a really, really easy example of this is every organization with respect to its own employees is a controller of their data. It decides what information it's collecting and how it's using that data. Very clearly data controller. A data processor, on the other hand, is an organization that effectuates the instructions of the controller. All it does is process. Uh, and so a really clear example of this, let's stay with um, the employee context, a payroll provider. Uh, so the, the organization gives the payroll provider information about who to pay and how much to pay them. If your payroll provider start, started deciding that on its own and paying people outside of the controller's instructions, we'd have a problem. Um, so that's, that's the way to think about this. There's the one that decides and the one that carries out um, the decisions. And that, that seems like it's going to be very straightforward on its face, but it actually gets um, a little bit more complicated. Uh, so it turns out that these foundational definitions aren't mutually exclusive, and there is some gray area between them. Um, and um, don't want to go into too much detail about um, how you tease this out, but um, in essence, what you need to understand is that organizations that have more room for discretion are more likely to be considered controllers. Um, so there's this tendency to think that um, if you're the organization that collected the data and you hand it over to someone else, that someone else is always going to be your processor. So think about your cloud service provider, your, your emailing provider. And that's true for those types of organizations that you, you provide the data to. Uh, but there are other types of organizations that you give the data to to exercise their discretion. So think about um, lawyers or accountants. Um, they get access to personal data in order to um, advise and, and really um, make their own independent decisions. And so um, not all third parties are processors. Some of them are controllers. And then there are uh, organizations right in the middle where it's really unclear. Payment service providers is a really good example. Obviously, we want payment service providers to follow the instructions. Um, of, of the controller and of the individuals making the payment. Um, so it would seem that their discretion is pretty limited. But if you try to tell a payment service provider how to provide their service, they're going to tell you you can't do that because they have to operate within a network of um, financial transactions and communications. And so actually the controller can't necessarily dictate all the mechanics of the payment process. Um, and, and furthermore, um, these, these companies also have to do anti-fraud checks for their own legal requirements, not under the instruction of, of the controller. Uh, and so for that reason, they can be sort of both. Um, they can act as controllers and processors for different parts of the service they provide. Um, so the, um, the Article 29 Working Party, which is now called the European Data Protection Board, um, has issued guidance on the concept of controllers and processors. And they say, what's important is that we're allocating responsibility and that we have a functional approach. There isn't really a clear, bright line. And some, some factors to consider are, if you're deciding the purposes, that's a very clearly controller function. Uh, but there are some essential elements of the means, so the how of the data processing, that if you're taking those types of decisions, you actually may be shifted from a processor role to more of a controller one. If you're deciding, for example, what type of data is collected, how long you're retaining it for, um, and who's going to have access to them, who you're sharing it with, uh, those, those look like more controller functions. And that's where you start to push more into the controller box. Um, and then as a, a final bit of ambiguity, you need to look at what the individual reasonably expects. So uh, controllers are understood to be responsible for the processing. Processors tend to work in the background. If the individual concerned uh, views the organization as responsible, then that's going to push towards a controller position. Yeah? Talk about controllers and processors. There is possibly a third option, a platform. For example, somebody's providing software as a service, like Word or something like that. Certainly, my clients 
your software as a service providers, yeah. would like very much to know that they're comfortably in the platform and that they're not obliged at all to the GDPR. Could you give us some sort of guidance? Or, or, we, or we're going to say there's no such thing. But I mean, at the moment, it's, it's a used word or, or any of these situations where actually the software is being provided to the client and all the processing or, or, or anything yeah. is being done by the client. It's a really good question and one that's um, super ambiguous and not at, not, at, not at all resolved by, um, by, by the literature. Um, so under the previous directive, um, there, there was an example in the recitals of telecommunication service providers. Um, so telecoms are controllers for their, their billing and um, traffic data. But what about for the content that travels through their pipes? Um, which I think is, is somewhat analogous to some platforms, um, some, not all. Um, and it really left open the question as to what telecoms do. Um, in the telecom space, I think you can argue more clearly that um, they're neither a controller or a processor because they're subject to such strict other regulations that kind of displace the, the data protection rules and they have these strict confidentiality measures. Um, but other platforms, it, it's much less clear uh, I, I think a, a lot of platforms do take the position that if they can't control the con content, they're really acting more as a, a mere conduit and um, don't take necessarily responsibility for all of that content. But that argument is not one that's getting a ton of traction. No, so that's the that's um, uh, so th this is um, these are the two notions with which data protection law and the GDPR, including, operates. So when there's personal data involved and anything is being done to that personal data, uh, you can be a controller or a processor. Uh, you can also be a joint controller, though, but that's something different. Uh, but you there must be some degree of responsibility even if so i would i would take the uh, hard uh, regulator line here and i would say that uh, it, it, it would be easier to fall under the processor situation and then depending on the mandate that you have as a platform uh, and the, uh, Gabe will uh, give us a taste of uh, what are the processor obligations and what are the controller obligations. So depending on that mandate you um, don't have actually uh, a, a lot of responsibility uh, towards compliance uh, with direct obligations under the GDPR, you will have some contractual responsibilities with the controller. But again, this will depend a lot on the case-by-case -case, um, situations. However, it's important to point out that when there is personal data and something is being done to that personal data, you can either be a controller or a processor it's, or a joint controller. Uh, and then it, it depends on, on how the responsibility is shared. It, it will depend on contractual arrangements, terms and conditions, um, and so on. Is it safe to conclude that all intermediaries are data processors and data controllers covered by the GDPR? Uh, they, they are either processors or controllers, or I see Carolina <laughs> wanted to add something. Um, I, I would say that when you have personal data that is being processed, someone is responsible for that personal data. It cannot be in ether. Well, but I, I just want to put out there that, and it's important maybe you raise the question, Pavan, that um, there is a third sort of bucket, which is neither controller nor, nor processor. So not all entities in the world are either controllers or, or processors or mm -hmm. even joint controllers. Uh, if you just provide uh, software, for example, mm -hmm. uh, under a license, and, but then, you know, it starts to get murky. So maybe you provide some support. Uh, uh, when you provide support, do you access the whole database or is it just a ticket where you may be a processor, but maybe just for a snippet of information, you know, it starts to sort of get into the spectrum. That's very misleading. Even if you just provide a, a, a software without accessing the data, why do you think that? Because that's how uh, uh, the big four uh, find it when they do audits. So, uh, Gabriela, if I just send so uh, sell software under a license and have no access to the data? Um, 
and know and where is like is there so yeah. I said oh, once yeah. you once yeah. you provide support you might access yeah. the data but if you don't provide support I, I just want to put out that the, there might be a third category so as yeah. a Uh, I have an answer you're not going to like very much. <laughs> GDPR says we don't care about your national law. <laughs> you have to find an exception in European law. And, and there is an exception for intermediaries in European law, but it doesn't take you out of data protection law. So it takes you out of other forms of liability. So we've talked a lot about controllers and processors. Um, this slide highlights why it's so important. Um, controllers, because they decide how and why data will be processed, are responsible for, in essence, all of the obligations of GDPR. Um, they need to decide um, how the data will be used and whether it will be done lawfully. They need to um, explain to individuals how they're doing that. Um, they need to provide for appropriate security and have uh, accountability measures in place. Processors, on the other hand, uh, are not subject to the same number of obligations under GDPR. Um, and, and it's important to know the context here. Under the directive, processors were not subject to the directive at all. Um, they had um, responsibilities to have in their contracts um, that they would provide appropriate security and they would follow the instructions of the controller. And that was it. Um, so the GDPR introduces new liability for processors. They are directly subject uh, for some of those obligations like security. Um, and then there are a number of measures, which we'll talk about later, that are going to flow down through the contracts um, and ultimately end up applying to processors, even though um, the GDPR doesn't apply it directly. The term processing is very key and it's a lot of work, but we haven't really defined what yeah, so constitutes processing under the GDPR. I forced them to skip that part, but... Uh, <laughs> What is processing? So processing is, is literally anything you can do to data. So the storage, storage. storage is processing. So uh, the definition is very wide. I mean, it starts with any operation uh, or set of operations performed on personal data, and then it gives examples uh, of such operations. And you can see here even organizing data, making data available to someone. Uh, alignment or combination of data, uh, even erasure of data is considered, uh, so you, what you do to the data is just erasing it, that's also considered a processing. Uh, um, let's get to territorial scope, uh, because I, I'm going to finish this part in five minutes, and maybe later in the day we'll get back to some of the open issues. Okay, territorial scope, it's a big one here. Um, the, the first thing to know is, um, well, in essence, the GDPR can apply to you in one of two ways. And the first way it can apply, just checking that out of the slide right, um, is where you're established in the EU. So you have a, your organization is based in the EU or has um, a branch or subsidiary there. And then the processing takes place in the context of that EU establishment. The GDPR applies. This is um, Article 3.1. And what's important to know about this is if the processing takes place in the context of the establishment in the EU, it doesn't matter where the data subject is. A really good example of this is the Cambridge Analytica case. Uh, so right now the, the, lead, um, the, the lead plaintiff on this is a US professor. And the US professor is arguing that data protection law, uh, laws in the UK apply to um, election advertising in the US because Cambridge Analytica was based in the UK and was processing his personal data there. So where Article 3.1 applies, then uh, it doesn't matter where the data subject is based. If, as I suspect is the case for the majority of people here, you don't have a presence in the EU, then you look at Article 3.2. And Article 3.2 says, um, if you're offering goods or services to individuals in the EU, 
or you're monitoring the behavior of individuals in the EU, then the GDPR applies. Um, notice I said individuals in the EU. This is not a citizenship test or a residency test. Um, a Canadian traveling through Europe is in the EU, and if you're offering goods and services to that person, um, you could be subject to, to GDPR. Um, we're waiting for guidance from the European Data Protection Board on this. It was due, I think, two months ago. Yes. So hopefully we'll have that soon. Um, there's some too. indication from case law and from the recitals that this concept of offering goods and services requires uh, a degree of intention, that there's um, some objective assessment that you've directed your activities at individuals in the EU. Like you're so, targeting a geographical area or yeah. you're, you're using, let's say, Spanish when you offer your services uh, to Spain. That There is some indication in recitals, but uh, yeah. let's see. That, that you accept payments in euros, for example. So, so I think the, um, the biggest sort of issue here is English, right? Because uh, um, as long as the UK is part of the union, I think Ireland, that's not their official language. Um, but so, Malta. Oh, Malta, Malta. Yeah. okay. So, so as, lo as long as English is one of the languages of the union, then ostensibly anyone who has an English interface, you know, the New York Times, um, is targeting their, their goods and services of the EU. How, how do you work around that? Or maybe you don't. I don't think you do. We've seen yeah, a number exactly. of, um, of websites um, that have blocked access to European visitors. Um, so that, that might be one way to work around it. Uh, but apart from taking measures like that, you're, you're likely to be caught if you're offering goods and services to individuals in the EU. Um, it's also worth noting, too, that, that the monitoring prong um, appears to be more rigid than the offering goods and services one. There doesn't seem to be a requirement for intention. And this is where a lot of websites get caught, because if you're um, doing behavioral tracking on your website, um, even if you're not intending to target an EU audience, but your website is accessible to them, then at least for that portion of your activities, not for everything you do, but for that portion of, that, of your activities, you would be subject to the GDPR, it seems. How does the CCTV cameras, I go into the country, I land down, I'm already under CCTV camera coverage. CCTV camera coverage is monitoring my behavior as an individual in the EU. Am I to argue that every CCTV camera operator would be uh, covered under the monitoring uh, the behavior of an individual and hence? You'd be caught by Article 3.1 because the CCTV operator would be in the EU. Non-EU based CCTV camera operator. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm it in monitors. India. You land in India, you're, the moment you land, you're on, on a CCTV camera. The operator is an Indian operator, but you are a, an individual from the European Union. But remember, it it's not about citizenship or nationality or residence. It's about uh, where physically the individual is, if you're looking so at a country too. Facility mm -hmm. in Brussels and it's running this right. network globally, and somehow the processing is in the context of what they're doing in Europe, where it otherwise. You're out. You're yeah. out. So for that situation, it wouldn't apply. E even if uh, you have European citizens coming to India and your system is set up there, the GDPR does not apply to that. So many hands were up, and then the lady and then the gentleman. What about uh, tourists? I'm roaming using my Israeli phone. It's There's no, there's no guidance on that. This is what, this is the guidance we are yeah. looking for for Article Three, Paragraph uh, Two, of the GDPR. Um, I mean, you know, there is a, the, the, you are a person that is in the EU. Uh, services are provided to you. There may be some criteria that uh, authorities or courts will come up with depending on a degree of uh, stability of your presence or something like that, but we don't have that yet. So uh, as, the, uh, as the situation is right now, the GDPR would apply um, unless we see some new uh, you know, definitions and guidelines. So, so at any point in time, I'm sure AT&T or Verizon have millions maybe of uh, US-based individuals who happen to sort of travel through the EU. They're basically, those companies are covered head to toe. Yeah. 
They have a big blanket. Excellent uh, point, Omer. And when I'll go to the EU next week, I'll make sure to submit some subject access requests to, okay. <laughs> uh, the lady to Verizon. Sales representatives, is that, um, are they working for you in a... Well, it's really important, the relationship between you and them is really important here. So one question would be, are they acting on your behalf? Are they resellers or... Um, I, there, there is some, re we are all like, <laughs> the GDPR dance, right. there is some sort of... So a, this is a third party yeah. organization? Is this a third party organization or is it your people who are employed by you? They're not employed by us, they get their, they, they sell all kinds of products. Yeah. So they tend to be independent controllers yeah. when they're resellers like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and so what you need to look at is whether um, your sales are in the context of their activities. Um, there's a difficult case from the Court of Justice, um, the Google Spain case, you may know it, it established the, the right to be forgotten under the directive. Um, and in that case, um, so Google Spain was the, um, the party at issue. And Google Spain just sold advertising. It didn't do any of the, the Google search engine stuff. All of that was done back in California. Um, and the court said, well, Google Inc. back in California is subject to um, EU law because um, the activities of the Spanish entity were inextricably linked with Google Inc. So Google Spain could only sell advertising uh, or, or was only selling advertising because it was benefiting Google Inc. The, they were so intertwined that, that you can separate them. Now, you, you could say that that principle would apply here. You could also say, well, maybe Google's a bit of a special case. Um, so I think you, you'd have to look more, more deeply at the facts, but I think yeah. we're getting close to time. So yeah, let's take uh, one last one and then move on. <laughs> see what the guidance says. Yeah. Um, I want to highlight one last point, because um, I think this is important for a lot of businesses. Um, so the last point is, what if you're uh, based in Israel, and you don't have any establishment in the EU, but you're selling to European businesses? So we've talked a lot about directing sales at customers, at, at consumers, individuals in the EU. But what if um, actually you're selling to businesses, and those <laughs> businesses then may be selling to, to EU consumers? Um, so this is one where we are, where I think guidance will be really important. But for the most part, if you're acting as a processor, then the question almost doesn't matter because you're going to have these detailed contracts that flow down GDPR requirements to you anyways. So if you're selling to businesses then, um, and acting as a processor, then you'll have to look to, to implement a lot of this stuff. And also very important, um, businesses are not protected as data subjects under the GDPR. So if you only have company data that you work with, like data about a company or an organization, the GDPR data protection law does not apply to that data. It's, it, it's only about data of individuals uh, protected as data subjects. No, I'm sorry, um, we have to move on because, I mean, there are endless questions to address, but we will continue the discussion here.
Uh, we'll also have a break for lunch. So I want to thank the speakers for this uh, first session. And Gabriela, you are staying. Uh, Jules will take over and introduce Carolina, who's replacing Gabe for this one.